Hello, everybody. It is my great pleasure to finally be able to attend this event. My name is Tim. Uh, I've been involved in Kubernetes, uh, more or less from the beginning. If you've been involved in Kubernetes, you might know me by some of my other names. Uh, the networking guy, he who takes too long to review my pull requests, Mr. No, or occasionally the person who approved my PR. I hope to play that role more often. Um, I've been in Kubernetes since the beginning. I started my track there uh, owning node-related stuff. Over time, I accumulated some responsibility for networking and storage. But most recently, the last year and a half, uh, I've really taken to the topic of multi-cluster. I really think it is the most important thing that we're facing right now. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing there today. So from the beginning of Kubernetes, we've had a concept of a, of a cluster. right? And most of Kubernetes concept space is, design, is centered around this idea of, of, a of a single cluster. And what do I mean by that? There, there's things that are related to the cluster, right? Nodes exist in a single cluster. The scheduler runs on a single cluster. Every cluster demands its own networking configuration. Um, but there's also some less obvious things, like volumes and load balancers are tied to the life cycle of your cluster. And these are some of the things that start to become problems for people. If you tear down a cluster, all of your load balancers, all of your volumes go away with it. Is that OK? In effect, we treat each Kubernetes cluster like a walled city. right? It's isolated. It's distinct from everything outside it. Inside the city, we have paved roads, running water, a post office, and a functioning government. It's, it's the height of society. But once you leave the city, it is not so civilized. We are, there are no roads, there are bears, and there are bandits. Uh, there's no central government, and there's no safe way to cross from one city to another city. And whenever people talk about this in the Kubernetes community, we typically just put our fingers in our ears and sing a song and pretend that we can't hear it. Um, this is not an acceptable situation. This is my belief. So I want to step back for a moment. Um, how do we end up in this situation? What causes people to have multiple clusters? Well, there are lots of reasons, um, and I certainly can't list them all here, but I want to talk about some of the ones that I hear the most, that I think are the most common, that we're going to try to tackle as part of the project. So one reason, one of the most common reasons we hear is location. Uh, for example, I have latency requirements. I need a cluster closer to my customers, right? Or I have jurisdictional concerns. My data can't leave a country. Um, or I have data gravity. I've already uploaded a trillion exabytes of data to Amazon, and I can't move it, right? Um, or what I call service gravity, right? I need to access other things that exist in a particular area. And this idea of location starts to overlap with the idea of reliability. Right? Uh, we call it infrastructure diversity, right? using multi-region to make sure that if something goes wrong in your cloud provider, you are not the victim of that. Uh, a zone or an outage doesn't bring down your whole business. Um, or you know, we talk about the, the meteor striking a data center. Right? Well, it's going to hit one data center. It's not going to hit both. Um, but blast radius, the, the idea of an explosion, can also be your fault. Right? It could be your applications. And so oftentimes, you want to just run in two clusters just to make sure that if I screw up, that my application doesn't go down. Another big one that we hear very frequently, isolation. Right? And isolation has many flavors. Um, you know, maybe you have distinct development environments. You do your development in one set of clusters, and your testing in another set, and your production in another set. Um, or you need performance isolation. You want to make sure that your most important applications are never impacted by your less important applications. Or maybe you just have different organizations. You have different business units, and you want to make segmentation based on those business units. Um, or you want to get a different bill for different, company, uh, different parts of your company. Um, also an interesting topic that's coming up more and more often these days is multi-single tenant. The idea of being a service provider and running an instance of my application for every one of my customers, or for every tier of customers. And you can end up having multiple clusters there, maybe even a cluster per customer. Right? So none of this is news, right? None of this is like, oh my gosh, I've never heard this before. Um, there have been a bunch of efforts in the multi-cluster space in Kubernetes, uh, more or less since the beginning of the project. We even have a SIG devoted just to this topic. Um, so as an anecdote, approximately all of the largest Kubernetes clusters uh, customers in the world 
have one or more of the problems that I just talked about, right? So what have we done to make their lives easier? Well, truthfully, we don't have a lot of great solutions yet, and we've had a bunch of false starts. So uh, I like to learn from history, so let's look back towards the beginning of the project uh, to the CubeFed project, also known as Ubernetes, which is the greatest name ever, uh, and unfortunately uh, didn't, didn't stick. But um, this was started well before Kubernetes even hit 1.0. Right. Early on, some folks saw the need to be able to coordinate across multi-clusters. Um, it started from an assumption, and the assumption was that uh, more or less all of the Kubernetes API surface could federate, that I could take multiple clusters and I could stick something on top of them, and I could control them all in a sort of a, a multiplex fashion. And uh, there was a sort of uh, dogmatic position that the Kubernetes API is the Kubernetes API, that there were no API changes between them. And if you could understand one, you could understand many. Uh, it also added a concept of a cluster as a resource. So you could say, you know, create clusters uh, through Kubernetes. Um, and then it added a bunch of controllers to do interesting things like coordinate across clusters or push the information down into clusters or they do, do application migration between clusters. Um, so what went wrong? Um, well, to start with, it needs a control plane, right? Um, it, we have sort of the uh, reductio ad absurdum argument. If I need a cluster to control my cluster, have I really solved the problem? Um, it makes some of the problems worse, right? I need this cluster. I now have to manage that. I have to manage uh, access control and authorization for that cluster. That cluster now becomes its own single point of failure. Um, and importantly, it holds credentials, long-term credentials, into other clusters, which was sort of identified as a major problem. Um, over time, the reality of the API was you can't use the same API at both levels, right? There are differences between them that are very important semantically, like which clusters does this configuration apply to? If it's not all of them, then I need to specify which ones. Um, or very commonly, template expansion. I need to insert some cluster unique identifier into the configuration for each cluster. Uh, and you know, some resources actually don't make any sense to federate. For example, pods, right? Kubernetes' fundamental unit of compute isn't the thing that you want to federate. Deployments maybe, but not pods. Um, also, we tried to implement a bunch of these controllers sort of ignorant of the infrastructure. We didn't really know what we had underneath us, and we tried to build things like Ingress without taking advantage of the, the tooling that was, that was there. Um, for example, cloud, cloud providers. Um, so the result was sort of a lowest common denominator uh, system, which wasn't very useful to most people. So as a SIG, we took a step away and said, OK, what are the useful parts of this? What can we take away from this? And move forward with. So we introduced a project called Cluster Registry. And Cluster Registry was like the smallest atom of usefulness that we could extract from Kubernetes to build forward on. And it was a Kubernetes API that lets you list your clusters. That's all it did. Um, and its goals were simply um, to allow other people to build stuff on top of it. And it reduced the Kubernetes API semantics. We didn't even guarantee watch semantics. So if you've used Kubernetes, watch is pretty fundamental to how it operates. Um, it, but we, we reduced those semantics so that we could try to get broader uh, adoption of this API. And this turned out to be too small, right? And not a useful uh, unit on its own. Uh, we didn't offer any lifecycle management. You couldn't create a cluster and then have a cluster come to be. It was just a way to list clusters that existed. Um, there are some other talks today about cluster API. You should totally go to them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on cluster API except to mention it. Um, it does define a whole lifecycle mechanism, which is really neat. So cluster registry, turns out it was too abstract. There's no details, uh, and just wasn't useful enough. So we've retired that project. So now we have kubefed v2, right? And we decided to take another tilt at this uh, federation project. Um, and it was evolved from the version 1 ideas, but it was less of a everything all at once. Um, it tries to be a little bit more specific and more useful. So there's only a specific set of types that we federate. Um, the API is known to not be identical. There's an affordance for template expansion and for placement configuration. Um, it still has low uptake. It's still not solving problems for people. Um, it's still sort of coming at it from a philosophical point of view and not from a practical point of view. It still has those single point of failure clusters. 
Development has slowed, uh, and at this point, we've proposed that we archive this as a project. This is getting more use than, than Federation v1, uh, but not a lot of development. So if all of that was bust, what now? Um, so we pivoted again, and we're trying to approach the problems of multi-cluster as a set of discrete problems, not as a philosophy. And what that really means is, what are people actually struggling with, right? We're going out and we're talking to our customers, uh, all of us, myself and Google and the Red Hat folks and the, and the Amazon folks and everybody. We're talking to our customers and we say, what actually are you struggling with? What do you really need to do? And how can we help you address those specific problems? And then we can let the more general models emerge if they want to emerge. So I'm not going to spend all my time here. Um, I'm afraid I will run over time, so I'm going to try really hard not to. Um, but this area is really interesting to me to try to figure out what people are struggling with. Um, so this is based on you know, a lot of the conversations that I've had with customers. Um, this is certainly not all of the problems, but these are the ones I think are most interesting and important. So I, my background in Kubernetes is in networking, so I, I tend to see this one as pretty important. Um, the idea of having one service in one cluster that can talk to another service in another cluster. It seems pretty obvious when you say it out loud um, that Kubernetes makes this really difficult. Um, what we typically call this east-west traffic. Um, this could be because of any number of, of decisions that have been made between your clusters, whether it's cluster per team or cluster per application. Um, and especially in a microservices world, this is really very common. Um, it's not as simple as this diagram, though, uh, because realistically, it looks maybe more like this. Uh, or it could even look like this, right? Um, so the, the point here is that services exist sort of in the soup of your clusters, and I want to be able to access them across the clusters. A related topic, then, is ingress. If I'm bringing east-west, a solution to east-west traffic, how do I solve north-south traffic? How do I bring traffic in from outside, from the internet or wherever, into my clusters and have multiple clusters. For example, what if I have customers in Asia and customers in Europe? I should have a cluster in each region, and I should be able to so serve customers from the cluster that's local to them. Um, for uh, example, most of the cloud providers have load balancers that can do this, but Kubernetes makes it exceedingly difficult to use those. And it gets even more interesting when you talk about multi-cloud or hybrid situations. Governance and policy is another topic that we hear all the time, right? Um, users want to control their clusters, especially larger enterprises. They need to show to their regulators uh, that we're doing the right things to put this cluster um, in a secure position. Um, sometimes we call this configuration drift. Um, I want to make all my clusters look the same in some dimension or another, whether that's RBAC rules or which CRDs are installed or gatekeeper, those sorts of things. But I want to push this out to all of my clusters. Um, another one that we get a lot is the idea of cluster migration to do upgrades. Anybody ever tried to do a Kubernetes upgrade in place? Did it work the first time? Right? It's, it's sort of known to be difficult. There are some traps. We hear from a lot of customers, wouldn't it be neat if I could just turn on a second cluster, move all my workloads over to it, shift all my services using multi-cluster services and multi-cluster ingress and those sorts of things. I should be able to just transparently move my data, move my workloads to another cluster. Uh, and clients should not see any of this. And then I can just blow up the old cluster. right? And at the end of it, I have a new cluster. I've done my Kubernetes upgrade. I can even skip versions if I need to, which Kubernetes doesn't allow. Um, and I can do this in a safe way. And if at any point it goes wrong, I can just go back and shift my traffic back the other way. Um, if this isn't seamless, it isn't useful, right? If it, if it blows up one out of 10 times, it's not going to work. Uh, another common refrain we hear from customers is the idea of tenants, tenancy, right? Now, tenant is maybe the second most overloaded word in our industry, service being the first. Um, but um, oftentimes, people do use clusters for a tenancy boundary. And it kills me a little bit, but it, there are reasons for doing it, and I can't argue with those reasons. So they get team-to-team -team isolation. They want to have automation and authorization control, like the, the config drift problems. Um, but they also want to do things like cost, billing, cost and billing roll-ups, or they want to do um, qu a quota, quota management across clusters. right? Um, and then the last one I'll touch on today is developer experience. right? Cluster, as, as a developer, I don't care which cluster you put me in. Just run me somewhere appropriate. Or maybe I care which region, but other than that, decide for me, please. Um, Kubernetes has nothing to do this yet. 
So I've stared at those problems for the last year and a half, and, I, and I'm trying to really figure out, is there a general model that comes out of these? Um, and for some of them, they feel like CubeFed. Right? CubeFed actually applies to some of these, but some of them not. Um, and if you try to overfit, it, we've seen it to be a problem. So I extracted a general model for the idea of resource propagation. So uh, I'm not going to read everything on the slide. Um, I'll post the slides later, and people can look at this. But uh, I call this the abstract multi-cluster resource configuration model, uh, or AMCRACM. Um, I'm not good at naming things. Um, so I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I want to call out, though, that this is an archetype, not a set of rules. You're not supposed to design your solution to this. This is what I have observed from reality. Note that nowhere in this model does it describe the control plane. It doesn't say you must have a control cluster, and it doesn't say you can't have a control cluster. It is designed to be abstract so that we can implement these solutions for customers to solve their real problems without being dogmatic about how we solve those problems. The control logic just has to exist somewhere. All right, so let's talk then a little bit about what we're doing today. So I want to go back to this picture, multi-cluster services, right? Um, again, as a networking person, this is sort of my favorite problem. I spend all my time staring at what Kubernetes does with services. Um, if I'm in a cluster and I want to access services in another cluster, why is this hard? I don't know why this is difficult. Kubernetes, we have a pretty workable service discovery system baked into the, the system, into a cluster. Can I use that? So what is a service? So a service in Kubernetes is, uh, in the simplest model, it's a set of endpoints. Right? It's a set of pods in my cluster that are acting as one. Do those endpoints have to be in the same cluster? No, not really. Actually, they can be anywhere. They're, they're IP addresses. Right? I can stick them uh, in the endpoints and bring them from anywhere. But anybody who knows Kubernetes knows the, the endpoints resource, which I've hit, and I've taken some liberty with the YAML. Um, anybody who knows this resource, this, this is a managed resource. I can't edit this. Um, I listed endpoints here because this is the way people typically think about it. But the reality is endpoints has now been obsoleted and replaced with this thing called endpoint slice. And endpoint slice is a more scalable API that lets us describe endpoints as a set of chunks so that you can have more of them. But it also means that you can bring them together from different sources. And I've highlighted here, we use a managed by label that says who's taking care of this endpoint slice. So the system, Kubernetes system in my local cluster can manage a slice. Um, and it relates back to the service. Um, but I can also come in and I can add my own endpoints that fit this same service label, uh, but are managed by somebody else. And so this means that I can define a service in cluster A that carries endpoints from cluster B. Right? Um, in effect, I can tell everyone about everyone else, and it's going to scale just fine, right? Well, no, of course not. It's, it's not going to scale very well at all. But uh, it actually works really well at the small end, right? Um, so we looked at this, and we thought about like how the user experience. How do we want customers to experience this? And we like the idea of, I'm just accessing a service. Right? It's not distinguishable, really, from a Kubernetes service. So we thought, this is the experience we want. So let's define a way to describe that experience. Right? Now, uh, what we've settled on is a new resource that we call service export. And what service export does uh, is it takes whatever services you want to publish to your other clusters, and it, and it exports them. Right? Shocking, uh, clever naming for once. Um, and again, I fiddled with the YAML to sort of make it fit here, but actually service export is literally that big. Um, and what it, take, it does is it takes your single cluster service and it elevates it into a cluster set service. Cluster set, what the heck is that? I just made that word up on the spot, didn't I? Um, so as a SIG, we, we stared at this problem and we said, okay, well, how do I know which clusters I want to export one service from and into? Right? What if I have 10 of them? What if I have 1,000 of them? So we define this word cluster set. And a cluster set is, is basically a set duh, of clusters duh, that 
are intended to work together, that fall under a common management domain, right? The goal is to be able to make assumptions about the fact that these things are in the same set, therefore there's a relationship between them. That doesn't have to be all of your clusters. You pick which clusters are in which sets, and then we can build on top of that. Uh, it's sort of a management domain. So um, a cluster set service is a service that works across my cluster set, right? So we're going to come back to this idea um, over time because it's a pretty fundamental building block. It sort of captures this idea of um, convention over configuration, and we're going we're to play with that a little bit more. So instead of drawing it this way, uh, I prefer to draw it this way, right? So now I have my cluster set. Um, in particular, this allows me to say that my cluster set service exists in any one of my clusters. Any number of those clusters can export the same service, and they will be merged together by some control plane. I'm not going to say where, because it's implementation defined. And clients who access the cluster set service could, in theory, use their local cluster or another cluster in their same zone. Or if there's a failure, it could fail over to a different zone. And the client doesn't need to know about clusters. right? I'm sort of erasing the concept of clusters from the uh, user who's accessing it. And when I merge these, client, these clusters together, uh, I'm going to rely on a concept called sameness. So sameness is the idea that within a cluster set, when you name things the same way, convention, that they, it implies a relationship between them. Right? So the most immediate example here would be a namespace. Right? If I have two clusters, and they both have a namespace foobar, and foobar means the same thing across those two clusters. Right? It implies ownership. It implies sort of identity. So within that foobar namespace, I can have a service called my front end, and I'm going to apply sameness to the service also. So if I'm building my multi-cluster services solution, I can say, well, you both have foobar, and you both have my front end. I'm going to merge the my front ends across each other, as long as you export them. right? Um, and this is, this is enough for us to continue to build on. Um, and so we, we've talked about this within our community, within the, the SIG, and we said, does, does this feel right? Does everybody sort of buy this? A lot of head nodding and everybody sort of running with this idea. So what else can we build on top of that? Ah, before I go, one last point. Um, I've offered semantics now for multi-cluster services. Right? It feels like a Kubernetes service. Um, and I've offered a potential way to implement it via endpoint slices, right? But I've not said that's the only way that you can implement it. And I know there are implementations out there right now that are doing different things, which is exactly what we were trying to do. Give implementations a chance to solve their own customers' problems in the ways that their customers need, while still giving their customers this idea of portability and Kubernetes uh, co consistency across environments. And we're trying to learn from the past from our mistakes, it's too early to standardize any one implementation. In fact, we may never standardize an implementation, but we can standardize on the semantics. So coming back to the, the second problem, let's revisit this diagram. This, this shows how users want to think about their multiple clusters. They want to think of it like a front door that comes into different clusters. Um, so now I'm going to modify the drawing and, and show the cluster set in there. And you can sort of see the effect of sameness. Again, if these two clusters have the same named service, and they're both exported, my ingress can then understand how to talk to them. Now, ingress is maybe not the best API that we've got. Uh, anybody, again, who's used it is probably sitting there going, uh-huh. Um, it's really difficult, actually, to make the ingress API multi-cluster aware. Um, we wanted to uh, reference the multi-cluster service as the back end, but the Ingress API is hard-coded to reference a regular service, and so we couldn't really make it work. The good news is that Ingress is dead, long live Gateway. Um, Gateway, no, Ingress is not dead. Ingress is here forever. We're never taking it away. Right? I just want to incentivize you to look at the a Gateway API. Gateway is a new API that we're working on in SIG Network. I think it just went beta in the last release. Um, it is a much more uh, flexible, richer API that has more extension points and is uh, better for pretty much every way than Ingress. Um, it's, it's kind of what Ingress always wanted to be, but failed utterly at. Um, and I can say that because I'm responsible for it. So um, multi-cluster gateway is just a gateway. 
there is no difference in the gateway API. You just change which backend you're pointing to. Instead of pointing to a service, you point it to a service import. Service import, what's an import? An import is the opposite of an export. When you create an export in one cluster, you create an import in other clusters. But that's a detail that users don't need to experience. Right? So I'm also going to mention Cluster API. Cluster API uh, also has a great logo. Um, uh, as a logo guy, I love this logo. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, a on Cluster API. I'm not the Cluster API expert. There's a couple other talks on Cluster API today. Um, in short, it's a Kubernetes-style API for managing clusters and cluster lifecycle. So you can almost literally say kubectl create cluster, and poof, a cluster comes to be. Right? And it's a little more complicated than that, because you have a million parameters that you need to specify. But you can use this to manage the lifecycle of your multiple clusters across multiple environments. Um, and it offers a really nice primitive for building even more automation on top of. Um, it's very Kubernetes-like. It feels great. Um, I'm also going to mention Cilium. So Cilium is a uh, networking product that fits into the Kubernetes ecosystem. It's not Kubernetes proper, but it is part of the CNCF family. Um, and it is a very powerful uh, set of tools that are used to build uh, networking solutions. Um, and it includes some multi-cluster concepts like multi-cluster identity and multi-cluster mesh, multi-cluster networking. Um, so again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I know Thomas will be talking about I mean, he's here. He must be talking about it uh, tonight, uh, I think, is on the agenda. Um, so as I come towards the end here, uh, I, I don't want to end without looking forward a little bit. So, these are some of the things that are in progress or are just starting to be discussed. Um, I don't want to make any promises about these things, when they'll come to be, uh, but these are all very interesting to me. Um, I've talked about services, but I didn't talk about policy. And it's sort of difficult to have services and not have network policy. Um, I will acknowledge that it's sort of an egregiously missing concept right now. Um, we're working on figuring out how to do this. Um, we have a new API coming out of SIG Network called Admin Network Policy, which is there to really to help people define um, tenants, the idea of uh, administrator-controlled guardrails on what your clusters can do. right? And it takes um, this, this meme of namespaces are not a good tenancy boundary because they're not solid enough, um, and it makes them a lot more s significant. Um, Multi-cluster scheduling uh, has been discussed a little bit in the SIG. Um, some people called it the work API. Um, and it fits sort of the model I showed before with the Cube Federation um, style, where you define an API in one place, and we process it down to which clusters it's going to select. And it will deploy those workloads into those clusters. Um, and then on the last one, uh, stateful sets, um, this is an area that I was just notified yesterday. There's a cap for that. Um, I didn't know, but apparently there's a proposal that is open uh, that is open just very recently about how to do multi-cluster stateful applications. So you can actually move data between clusters. So you can start to achieve that uh, seamless migration, that blue-green cluster upgrade that I showed before. So maybe when I edit these slides, I'll move that one into the present category instead of the future category. Um, but I hope, I hope this gives you a picture of what's coming um, in Kubernetes and multi-cluster. This area is my passion right now. This is what I think of as the most important thing that my customers are dealing with. Um, my customers is everybody who uses Kubernetes. Um, this is what I spend most of my days talking to people about and thinking about, trying to help make it easier. If you're out there and you're looking at this going, yeah, I have those problems, I'd love to talk to you. I'll be here all day, obviously. Um, and I want to talk about, specifically, are these things starting to resonate for people? Do they, do they, do they make sense the way we're proposing them uh, so that we can make sure they fit? Because if they don't fit, I'd rather throw them away and start over, move it to the past category, and start again and figure out what does fit. Uh, thank you all for your time. Yeah. Yeah.